Hello everyone, this is Chris from the New Syndicalist editorial team. Earlier this month we were invited by FAU, the Freie Arbeiter Union, the Free Workers Union and an Arco Syndicalist Union based in Germany. They were holding a conference in Hanover, Germany and wanted us to give a presentation on activism and growth within syndicalist unions. We extend our gratitude to FAU for the opportunity to do this and their hospitality during our visit. We took this invitation as an opportunity to reflect on our experiences as organisers and activists within the industrial workers of the world in the UK in a period of rapid growth, following a rebirth of the union in the mid-2000s. What resulted was a very honest and productive discussion on the key challenges facing base unions, many of which were recognised by the community of union militants in attendance. We discussed a wide range of issues from the best means to collect members' dues to the often controversial issue of paid staff and organisers. We present here as a special episode of Talking Chop, the audio of the main presentation, in the hope that it proves to forward the debate on sustaining the growth and development of syndicalist unions, both here and as a means of informing debates and discussion on how best to move forward on shared challenges everywhere. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank our Patreon subscribers who have generously offered to give a small amount of money to support the ongoing work of New Syndicalist. Thank you Alistair, Alec, Andrew, Colin in Cardiff, Jed, Josh, Lydia and R. Thank you for helping the work along and for giving what you can. If you can afford to give a small amount of money each month to help sustain our project, all money given will ensure that the website remains ad-free will help us to maintain our online archive of audio content, as well as allowing us to invest in new audio equipment and fund the travel of new guests. Information on how to be a subscriber is available at patreon.com slash new syndicalist. Thanks for supporting New Syndicalist and thanks for listening. Enjoy the episode. Cool. So yeah, I'm Andy. I'm the Northwest England area organiser for the IWW and I'm a member of a blog and podcast called New Syndicalist. So this is a resource for trade union organisers, particularly those interested in like radical and militant organising within, mainly within the UK, but we have done published stuff from North America as well. So yeah, I've been invited to do a talk on the growth of the union over the, the past 10 years in the UK um, and the kind of the successes we've faced, the struggles we've had, opportunities we've missed and the potentials going forwards. I'm going to be spending quite a bit of time on the middle bit, the struggles, partly because I think that's a really useful thing to for us to look at, but also because it's what everyone here has experiences of like problems they face with the union, right? I want to make it clear that I'm not speaking as an official capacity of the IWW. The stuff in these slides, I've run it by quite a few organisers that I know in the IWW, and we've largely agreed on it, but it's not like this has come from our conference to your conference as like an official thing from the IWW. What we're going to be looking at, an introduction to New Syndicalists and a, a brief history of the IWW in the UK, just going over the last 10 years, so I'm not doing any previous iterations of it or anything from 1905 or whatever. I'm going to look at successes, problems and missed opportunities and our relationship with other grassroots unions in the UK that have formed in recent years. Then look at future opportunities and barriers that we'll overcome and then kind of break out into a discussion and Q&A, hopefully with you guys comparing it to your experiences in the foul, what you what you relate to, what you don't and you know where you'll go. Cool. So yeah, um, our blog, uh, our blog and podcast has been inspired by similar blogs around the North American IWW. So one called Re Recomposition and one called Lifelong Wobbly. Wobbly is a nickname or a term for a member of the IWW. And another blog from the Swedish movement. All of these kind of focus on the like lived experience of workers at work and their kind of campaigning and organising experiences rather than like a historical overview of what happened in you know 1917 or whatever. So we try and replicate this within the UK and within the North American syndicalist left as much as we can. So we aim to be a source of worker-led uh, anti-capitalist trade union theory and practice. So we want to provide support for reflection, stru struggle and troubleshooting. I guess particularly the UK context, but we are open to publicate like content from outside of the UK. 
Yeah, we felt that something that's absent from a lot of left writing and a lot of theorising is a practical and accessible approach to organisers' direct experiences. And we believe that better educated, equipped and experienced organisers have an important role to play in shifting the balance of power in our workplaces and communities. So that's um, the like aim of our project and what we aim to do. So, yeah, the philosophy that un underpins that, three basic principles. So, one, that all our articles are practical, so they're focused on, like, everyday real issues and can be implemented by people that are reading them. It's accessible, like, we try and have all our content be able to be read on the bus to work or on the train to work, and ideally, with, like, we don't want to use content uh, that is that couldn't be understood by someone that's only finished secondary school, so doesn't have a university education. We also want our work to be transformative. Like We want there to be real suggestions at the end of it that you can take away and implement in your own workplace or in your own organising as much as possible. So yeah, that's just like where I'm coming from and where this project's coming from, just so you understand it a bit more. But yeah, the uh, IWW in the UK. So... We restarted in the UK in 2008, so there have been previous iterations of the IWW or IWW-inspired unions in the early 20th century and before then, but um, it kind of restarted in a real way in 2008. So for the kind of first three or four years of it, it was predominantly a network of militants in TUC, so the Mainstream Trade Union Congress confederation and all of the organizing that we were doing was done TUC uh, TUC is a trade union con congress so it's like an umbrella of moderate social democratic trade unions within the UK yeah in 2011 our kind of organizing stepped up in a big way and we actually had campaigns in workplaces as the IWW rather than as another union done by it like but led by the IWW so our Big campaigns then with the Pizza Hut Workers Union. So we were organising stores in predominantly in Sheffield in Yorkshire, but um, also around the UK, winning a 20p rise for all delivery drivers working for Pizza Hut. And uh, John Lewis uh, Cleaners campaign, which is... Uh, John Lewis is a department store in the UK, and that was kind of where the start of the London Cleaners movement that some of you may be aware of or may have seen. Um, yeah. From 2011 to kind of present, we've been doing a lot of direct action casework in hospitality. So someone who works in a bar, works in a restaurant and doesn't get paid enough or hasn't been paid for the shifts they've worked or whatever, will often contact one of our branches and we'll resolve that through either through strongly worded letters or through strongly held pickers outside the shops. In 2015, we reached a milestone of over 1,000 members. So which was a, quite a formative moment for everyone concerned. And 2017 to present, we've been doing delivery and Uber Eats organising. Yeah, we've had, we've had strikes in Bristol, Glasgow, Cardiff, London, Manchester. The biggest strike that we led was in October the 4th, alongside other unions working in hospitality and fast food. And we had over 2,000 delivery riders across the country on strike, which is... Considering our union wasn't at 2,000 members then, it was quite impressive. 2018 to present, we finally reached over 2,000 members, so we doubled our membership within three years. Organize, we've been organising in logistics in uh, Midlands, around Birmingham, in England, and in London. And in 2019, we've been organising in English as a foreign language, uh, predominantly in London, but in other areas as well. Yeah. How many branches do you have? I think about 15 but I need to in check. different cities? Yeah, so different cities. Yeah, branches and groups across the country and in Ireland as well now. Okay. And um, what do you mainly attribute the growth to? So this doubling in member? I don't know if that's an easy question or you're going to talk about. I mean, we'll be going over some of the stuff there, but I think I think one of it has been the, the kind of campaigning we've done. Another thing is that it, we made it a lot easier to join the union, so you can join okay. the union online through filling out a form and setting up the direct debit which obviously isn't particularly glamorous it doesn't sound very exciting but if you google union for this and you find you find it online you can you can join quite easily okay
So yeah, some of the successes that I think are notable for us is that we've had consistently a 10% or higher growth rate for the last five years. So we do grow by about 200 members uh, every year. We've had organising successes in industries which are considered unorganisable by a lot of trade unions or were considered unorganisable by a lot of trade unions. So this is fast food, cleaners, the uh, so-called gig economy, such as cycle couriers, and migrant workers that tend to work in a lot of those industries. Slightly less glamorously, administrative successes, kind of like what I mentioned, but also, yeah, a number of things that we've done like internally to make it so that joining and staying a member of the union is a lot easier and we're not losing people through our own bureaucratic, I'll try not to swear, but bureaucratic mistakes. Yeah, we've also, as well as that, been developing the union's rules and procedures as the union grows. So we've moved from an organisation where everyone knew each other and everyone could fit into a, a small room to something that can scale a lot easily, a lot more easily. And we've also been delivering training. So we run a workplace organiser training and a UK employment law training so that our members can represent workers. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, the training, how often do you give them? Are they given on demand? Is this a every three months kind of thing? Yeah, so it's largely given on demand. Uh, a branch wants to put one on and they contact the training department in the UK. Which is a national? Yeah, a nas- like a national group of trainers. I think it'd probably be safe to say like every two months there's one happening somewhere in the country. Cool. Uh, Lucy, did you? Uh, yes. I was going to ask about the administrative successes because that's really a big topic. Are you going to expand on that later? So some of it was moving from a system where people could pay like two or three different ways as membership to like solely focusing on one way of paying people. So that's like a default one now. So rather than some people paying in cash or some people paying in checks or some people paying by standing order or direct debit, we've kind of strong, we strongly encourage everyone to pay by direct debit now, which means that we don't have to have like volunteer or kind of part-time admin workers having to look at four different ways of whether a member's in good standing or not. That's one of them. So you have paid all this stuff, you have paid administrative workers, right? So we have three paid administrative workers. So one part-time. So one doing the union's financial accounts, one processing membership and database work and one doing the kind of comms work of the union. So making sure the email lists are up to date, making sure that the website is access like is up and running. Um, and the different ways we communicate with our members he helps us. And that was a massive boon for us and that was something that we looked at when we were about a thousand members and it really helped because a lot of the people doing that were like completely burnt out by the time we got around to employing them. Yeah? Are your branches autonomous or are you like a central organization? We'll be coming on to that. Our branches are, yeah, they, they can largely set their own policies and organizing directives and stuff like that. They have to follow certain like guidelines, but then every, I, I presume that would be the same with, with that. But the membership ship administration is it done? The membership administration is done nationally, yeah, centrally. So you join, you go online and then you, you join the union and then you get assigned to a local branch and the branch get told you've joined but the branch doesn't have to process your membership in any way. No. On, on top of that, so branches don't have any treasury issues? Branches get a 50, they get a 50% split of the membership. So I pay £5 a month to the IWW, £2.50 of that goes to the national, £2.50 of it stays my local branch. And then each branch has like an elected treasurer that handles that money. Okay, so slightly more depressingly, some of the problems that we found ongoing throughout the union. And I'll be really interested to know if this is something that you guys have found as well. So there has been like a kind of continued tension between branches and unions and the national union in some way. There does seem to be a view that the local branch is almost completely separate and completely autonomous from the union as a whole. And while we do want branches to be able to make their own decisions and make their own organising, when you want to do something across the union or when you want to spread something across the union, this does become like an issue that hopefully we can work around, but is it is quite difficult. We also, I guess, I, in my opinion, have like a lack of clarity over our organisation's purpose. So when you read our organising reports, there'll be a branch that's 
largely been focused on anti-fascist work. Another branch that wants to do prison abolition organising or has been doing Kurdish solidarity or like more general kind of reading groups and self-education. And then you look at what they've been doing in the workplace and it's there's like nothing there. And obviously like everyone in this room what like views unions as a vehicle for like positive social change. But we do understand that that happens through the workplace as much as anywhere else and it's a bit of a mixed message when you join a trade when you join a union expecting it to be focused on workplace issues and then you see that its active members have been doing Kurdish solidarity work instead of trade union work we kind of don't have much of a grasp on who our members are in terms of like a number of things so like the languages they speak where they work like keeping up to date with where they work or where they live and the kind of skills that they can offer the union is stuff that we don't really have a clear picture on that. I think largely because you can join online, like I said. So that's obviously one of the bonuses of more old-fashioned way of doing trade union recruitment. Finally, like demands that we make of our volunteers are quite often default to like a day-long or a weekend-long meeting, training or conference like this, which excludes a lot of people that can't or won't commit to this time. We are now trying to make... For example, our training an afternoon long instead of a weekend long. Because obviously a lot of people don't want to spend a whole weekend in a room doing union stuff. Like we all, I know we all do, but um, if the, yeah, sadly not everything like us. Yeah. What do you think? Um, how many of these new members are really active on <coughs> how many active members or at least um, members you could uh, you can mobilize? Yeah. So I guess those are like Those are two slightly, I think those are two slightly different questions, the idea of like active members and members you can mobilize. Yeah. So I think active of those 2,000 members, we probably have about 150 to 200, which are in some way like active within the union through like an officer position or like regularly attending meetings or doing like casework and like organizing for our union. Mobilizing becomes like higher when it's an interesting thing. Like you ask people, do they want to go to a branch meeting? Not a lot of people do. You ask them, do they want to go to a delivery strike? It's a much higher number. But yeah, there's still like, we still do have like quite a large paper membership or like larger than we'd like it to be. Yeah? Yeah, because uh, I've been in many, <coughs> well, talking to people from many different uh, unions and uh, groups and anarchist uh, groups and everything. And it all seems to boil down to the 10% rule. Like yeah. our, our 10% of your you membership become militants. Yes. And it seems to be happening in all, all, all over the place. So now you're talking about 2,000 members and between 150 and 200 militants. Yeah. That's a 10% rule again. Um, well, obviously, the, the solution is either to try and get more people involved so you, so you get more over that 10% or get a lot more mi members so you get the same percentage but still get more militants. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I get. I guess the other thing is that it's like 10% like active members at a time of like relative mm -hmm. calm or stability. Like obviously when things are when things are more conflicted or more like mm -hmm. there's more going on, you get more members active, don't you? That's like that's something that again you see across across the like trade union movement. Yeah. So yeah, I want to talk about as well like missed opportunities that I think we had. So stuff that like looking back on it now, I think. Sorry. Uh, because you mentioned these problems, will you also have uh, solutions or at least attempts to solve these problems? Or because, like, uh... we're, we're going to solve them together. <laughs> <laughs> because it's getting more and more depressing. <laughs> it <laughs> is. Least opportunities. It is. They... <laughs> 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 yeah. But that's pretty good. <laughs> um, I'm happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> They wouldn't be problems if we had the answers, would they? So like, we're going we're to talk about it. But like, yeah, so looking, when I wrote this and I was looking back on stuff that we did, stuff that we didn't like follow up with or didn't like build on, you know, I was kicking myself. And like, I think that's a really important part of organising to be able to reflect on, it, although it's a depressing part, you're right, but to re reflect on like our failures as well as our successes so that we can try not to do that in future. So, yeah, one of the failures that I think really does spring to mind is the failure to properly build on those 2011 organising successes that I mentioned. So we never really spread the Pizza Hut drive well enough, like outside of Sheffield and Yorkshire. 
and the majority of the cleaners branch, the cleaning campaign that we're running, left to form a separate union called the IWGB that we'll talk about in a bit. We spent the next four to five years then largely doing casework and protests outside of quite small shops that have like a transient workforce, which meant that we struggled to build density in any particular industry. And like we largely didn't really use the reputation that we've got in Pizza Hut and with this cleaning campaign to build membership in a lot of larger or medium-sized employers, which obviously is a more stable and a more stable workforce, or hopefully more stable workforce, and one that you can build on. A kind of failure to grow out or move outside of the activist and an- activist and anarchist scene. Obviously, maybe a little bit controversial in this room. We, <laughs> for us in the UK, we saw a lot of members join in the between 2008 to 2011 when the anti-austerity and the student movement were there at the largest in the UK. When these movements kind of died down because they didn't win, a lot of the people that we were using as like, they've, they've developed skills in this and then they come join the union and we can, like, we can rely on those skills. That kind of beltway just like fell apart. We didn't get those like militants that we're talking about that have skills. At the same time, in the UK, we've seen like a kind of turn to social democracy, like the Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party, which doesn't really have the same, the IWW doesn't really have the same appeal to those kind of members. And if you're like a new, newly like pol- politicised person, you probably go to like Labour Party and the organisations around it, as opposed to looking at the kind of extra parliamentary like anti-party political scene that we recruited from quite heavily. We've kind of had a failure to properly communicate the successes that we have made. So we've done a lot of really good casework individually for met like hundreds of people across in the country. So like in ones and twos, we've like kept people in jobs. We've secured them like pay rises or won back like hundreds of thousands of pounds of wages for people. But we've just like never really put this out there in the public in a way that can like build our organization's profile and reputation and also let other people know about us and about the um, that you can take action at work and you can fight back. So we are getting a lot better at this now, which was largely a change in who did our communications and what like the focus of that was. And it's something that we've noticed that the other like grassroots unions in the UK are really good at and they use it as like an organising tool. And it's something that we're like now trying to catch up with. Again, so this is a controversial one within the IWW. So again, like I said, this is not an official position of the IWW, but uh, it's my opinion. It's the opinion of like a number of people that we probably should look at part-time paid organisers to coordinate our work. We've had like a lot of the campaigns that we've done recently, we've kind of realise that there's um, there's a real limitation to bringing out like 2,000 people on strikes and not solely relying on like volunteer work, especially when you're organising like outside of it. The delivery strikes, we had a number of our members in it, yeah, but a lot of the people that we were heavily reliant on worked a nine to five job and like had to do it around that kind of time. They weren't working for delivery. So as we continue to organise new places that we don't necessarily have a foothold in it it would be easier if we had someone that was paid at least part-time to solely look at that i'm aware that's a controversial opinion within the syndicalist movement but i think it's one that's worth properly debating rather than just relying on previously held like puritanical anarchist ideas so a failure to gain recognition in both senses of the term in the industries that we organize in So within the UK, if you have over 50% of a workforce, you can go for a recognition agreement with the company, which means that when when the company tries to change conditions, it has to sit down and negotiate with the union. Yeah, so you have to have 50% of a bargaining unit. We've attempted this in a number of places, and we haven't yet managed to get that recognition agreement. So that's something that like, we do need to look at. And also kind of more broadly, if you ask people uh, about the IWW, they'll say, oh, they've, they've done delivery strikes or they do hospitality stuff, but there are other unions that also do those industries and do them as well, if not like better than we do at the moment. So it is a, that is a real kind of issue that obviously like you want your union to be recognised as one that is fighting and winning in like key industries or 
that you're organising it. And yeah, we've also, I think it's fair to say, struggled to keep pace with other newer grassroots unions. So the next slide will be talking about that and going on to that. But yeah, are there any questions there or comments? Yeah? I think the paid organisers thing is just really, really interesting. Because, of course, like you want the union to be run by people who you know how to run it, so people who are workers themselves are not paid by the union per se. But at the same time, it's just it's just so much work. Like, as a really active organiser, you sit 10 hours in your free time doing the union stuff and settling everything. And I would just like to know, like, is it worth it? How can we get there? Like, do you know maybe how much cost? How much does cost the union? Like, to pay three people for part time to do administrative work. I don't. They're not paid minimum wage. The sneaky comment there. Um, <laughs> they're not. They're paid a living wage. Thank you very much. We employ three people on fifteen hours a week. At what I think is. It was £10 an hour when it started off. It might have gone up with inflation. So I guess that answers your question there, roughly £500 a week. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that in euros. I think it's probably the same. Yeah. You still didn't uh, try it out, right? Was, uh, was paid organizers? No, we haven't tried oh, okay. with paid organizers. Yeah, because I had a, like, a conversation with like, the organizer co uh, collective. And way, like, say, like, way also, like, uh, organized people from Verdi and stuff, and uh, the problem is there, I think, where it's uh, just very short-term thing, like they go into one uh, one company and when finding more members for the union, but after they are gotten away, the structures were weak and it didn't be a long-term project, so yeah. I don't know, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that like that is true, but I think that's also mirrored in a lot of the organizing that, like, uh, single plus unions have done without paid organisers. Mm, yeah. So I'm not sure, like, it's definitely a problem and it's maybe like more more of something that you would see with paid organisers than not, but being able to sustain and maintain like a presence in a workforce is one that a number of unions like ours have struggled with independently of whether they've had people spending a certain amount of time on it. Yeah? yeah. I have a very question about the last point. Um, what's your relation to the IWGB, I think? I'm yeah. confused. Are they, were they part of the IWGB? Yeah, so the, the next slide we will be going over the different ones in, in more depth. So, yeah. I didn't understand why you failed to gain this recognition. Um, because I understand that you were more than 50% in this in some companies yeah so you have to get 50 percent, and then you have to sit down and negotiate with the company over what that recognition agreement will look like and what it'll cover okay. when we've got to that stage they have decided to recognize another union other than us that has been one of the problems i mean there's also been the problem that we don't have a lot of places where we have over 50 percent majority in a number of the ones where we have, it's been another union has been given a like a what we call a sweetheart deal. So like a, they've been given access to this company when they promise a less militant or they they think it'll be a less militant and easier. But they have the other fifty percent then. Yeah. So one hundred percent of the workforce is unionized, but just in two different unions. No. Oh, no, no. Like, it's an honest question. Okay, you can. So they can a company can voluntarily enter into a recognition ah, agreement with anyone, and <laughs> then you get in. A, like really spurious legal battle with the with between two companies and we're a union of two thousand people. They're I a union of yeah. yeah. I, I didn't realize they could do it without. Yeah. Oh, cool. So they make a deal with the trade union that doesn't have any union members in, in the company. Or doesn't have a majority, but may have some members. But okay. they need to have at least a couple of members, right? Or I'm not sure. Um, potentially not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, um, looking at the other grassroots unions within the UK, so I've largely picked ones here like in some way related to the IWW. There are like other small independent trade unions within the UK, but these are like the largest of those and the most popular and ones that I thought people here would want to know about. So I've done them alphabetically, so there's no reason why we're, which one we're starting with. One of the unions in the UK is an organisation called ACORN, which is a tenant slash community union, so for those people who rent their houses uh, rather than own them. 
with quite large branches in Bristol, Sheffield, Manchester and some other cities in the UK. The next three unions that I'm mentioning are all unions that started off in London in the cleaning industry. So one called Kaiwa, which is Cleaners and Allied Industries Workers Union. One called the IWGB, uh, Independent Workers of Great Britain, which started out as a cleaners union in London uh, and is now organised over industries, so care work and delivery and Uber, and Uber drivers. This union uses a lot of media pressure in its campaigns well, as long as pursue as as well as pursuing interesting legal cases. So one's over whether this worker is self employed or whether they're not and that gets them a lot of like press attention through that. The UVW, which is a bit a similar union to the IWGB, and again they started as a cleaners union in London and it organises other industries but at the moment solely in London. So yeah, I want to touch here on the density of their membership compared to the IWWs, because I think that is an interesting thing to look at. So the IWW has um, about 400 to 500 members in London. So this is our largest branch in the world across the union. The IWGB, UVW probably have about 1,500 to 2,000 members in London. Each, yeah, so separately. And um, Cairo, the cleaners' union, probably has a thousand or slightly more. Acorn's largest branch is in Bristol with about 500 members or potentially more, and about 1,500 nationwide, so 1,500. Part of the reason for that is, again, like I mentioned, they're using media pressure quite well. They also all heavily rely on full time paid organisers to build their union's capacity. Obviously, they do use a lot of volunteer workers and organisers, but one of, like, they do have people working around the clock on their organisations. All of them use similar tactics in organising two hours, and this is partly reflected by shared origins. So most of these unions, with the exception of the UPW, were started by past IWW organisers and members. I could go over the history, like family relation of it, but it'd be a lot of, lot of remembering for me. Yeah? Uh, I didn't get this. What exactly is a community union? Is it like for rent? Yeah, so yeah, renting. Yeah, oh, okay, but, but what, like how do they fight? Like, uh, do they just didn't pay rent for something? It's a lot of like uh, picketing and pressure on landlords and on the landlord mm -hmm. agencies, the letting agencies. Yeah, they use, yeah. Like through public? Uh, yeah, public public like campaigns and media pressure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you think, so you, you kind of use the media in the same way, and there are all these other similarities. Do you think that despite the numbers, it boils down only to that they use lots of pay workers? I, I think it's both. So they're all based in London, which is where everything is in the UK. It's the capital city. And all of the, pretty much all of the journalists and newspaper agencies or whatever work there. So it's a lot easier to get that media attention. If something happens in London, it's considered national news. If it happens anywhere else, it's considered local news, right? I think as well, there is like a... I think it's undeniable that if you have someone working 40 hours a week on an organisation, they're going to do more than if you had someone working like five to eight or five to seven in the evening on that campaign. Like, I think that's just an undeniable truth. Like, so I think that is a large part of, yeah, why they've grown larger than we have. So why would you have a full-time working member, full-time organisation? I mean, I'm not saying I will go for that, I'm just saying... Yeah. I see that's happening. Right? So, I mean, it, it, it's like, it's obviously a thing where there are differing opinions on it within the IWW because there's there are people within the IWW who come from a, like, a more anarcho-syndicalist, like, traditional viewpoint of how unions should, should run. So they are going to be less in favour of paid organisers, like Lucy mentioned earlier. Uh, so you call them these grassroots unions, and uh, so I guess they're not yellow unions, but they have those uh, full-time paid organizers. So uh, what I'd be interested in is um, how do these differ from the uh, wobblies, um, both politically and, and structurally? That is a good question. So they are all felt like to the left of the kind of t the trade the main mainstream trade unions within the UK in terms of their like rhetoric and in terms of their organising style and how militant they are within it. I think the IWW is a lot more explicit about the kind of society it wants to see the world be, whereas these like these unions are less focused on like a vision of a world outside of 
capital. If you're a smaller union, the powers of bureaucracy are less because you don't have the resources to have someone on 100k, 200k, like thousand pounds a year or whatever. Nice. Um, so that that is a difference between them and mainstream trade unions. Um, about the paid staff thing, like you said, it was about the anarcho-syndicalist structures having very like set ideas about how the union should be run, and I think that's true. But it's not anarcho-syndicalism talking there. I think what's talking there is being afraid of being afraid of change. You know, like it's the way we always have done this, this way and everything. But how is it not? An upper syndicalist can pay people a bit of money when they're putting hours of work into union administration. Like, I see this in the power a lot also. Yeah, I mean... It's, it's not the anarcho syndicalist view, it's more the conservative thing. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, um, it is something I've like repeatedly said that some of the most conservative people I've met have been anarchists. <laughs> <laughs> in a small sea conservative way, whatever, but yeah. Yeah? Um, do you work with these unions or kind of do you see them as competitors? I kind of feel like through the presentation it's like we're competing with these guys, but could you... Yeah, that is... I guess that's because of the way I've framed it as we have all these problems, here are these other unions. <laughs> which the which, which like, I guess that like the, the like narrative I've done there gives that impression. Okay. We work with the IWGB on delivery organising and, you know, we did... Like in the, the Manchester delivery strikes that I organised... The IWGB brought their members out in a couple of other cities across the UK in support, which was really helpful. And we do have like a cha like channels of communication with them. And then we will go along to the other unions like strikes and demonstrations where relevant. So it's the phrase that's often used is like they're sister unions of ours. And um, obviously anyone here who has brothers and sisters knows that like sometimes you get on and sometimes you... Uh... <laughs> um, I have just one last comment. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the biggest thing you kind of touched on this as well, these aren't revolutionary unions, meaning they don't have long-term revolutionary social goals. Yeah, right? that's true. That's the biggest difference I see. And then that there is a difference between hiring administrative workers and hiring organizers, which obviously the IWW has seen, yeah. not stupidly, because you could hire, I mean, hiring admin workers is different than hiring someone to go in and organize workers. Yeah. I think that it deserves a discussion, I agree with yeah. you. But I think it's not just because people are conservative who are thinking about 36. It's there are actual reasons for not doing it. I'm not saying that yeah. will win the discussion, but... Yeah, I mean, like, I I think when I, I framed it in the slide as, like, experimenting with... Like, right. I don't right. think we yes. should go, like, fall in, pay someone, like, 40 hours a week permanently forever. Like, I don't think that would be sensible. Like, we should, we should look at it as, like, part-time or like have a time frame on when we want to review it or something like that. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's possible that in the future uh, some of these unions and your unions um, might merge. I, like, I wouldn't rule it out. I think there's potential for some of them to merge or like, have a closer relationship within them. Like, like I said, there, is, there are reasons why there are three separate cleaner, cleaners unions in London <laughs> that might also give you an answer there, but I, I can't speak to that particularly well. <laughs> The kind of the barriers um, that I see the IWW like looking at in the future, I've kind of said them throughout this, but there's minimal concentration of power in any industry or workplace. I think with the exception of Deliveroo, there's like, there's very few like medium sized or large companies that we could have like a significant impact on at the moment, which obviously as, you know, militant trade unionists, we understand the like withdrawal of labour and the impact that has as something that can change society and we don't currently have that so that is a barrier to us kind of the current IWW campaigns that we run are again like particularly small compared to the working class as a whole so like our, our membership is at 2,000 members which is is really good but there's 60 million people in the UK and like like staffing and scope like we have free paid administrative workers and our volunteer staff is again like we said it's like 10% of our membership spread out across four countries which isn't isn't ideal and um, kind of finally we have like a like a lack of strategic direction so there aren't like industries that we think in five years time we want to have recognition agreements with or like strong density within these workplaces we kind of we take anything we can get which is a strength and it is a weakness because it means that it's quite hard to focus on what we're doing and like get resources done for those, those kind of campaigns well
and then I'll talk about some of the positives, <laughs> because it's very late in the afternoon, and all I'm doing is depressing you. For all that I've said there, we do repeatedly like punch above our weight. There's very few other unions that can say that they brought out the equivalent of their entire membership on strike in the last year, like we can, with the October the 4th demo. We are now getting a lot more media coverage because of that. We are winning more victories because of that. Fast food workers, couriers and cleaners, like we still have organising drives and membership within all of those industries. We've got a membership that mainstream trade unions would kill for. Like we are active, most of our members are considerably younger than the average trade unionist in the UK and our membership is dramatically more diverse in terms of where it works and it's like general identities and stuff like that. So are there any questions there? Yeah? Is it true that they would kill for that? Because I think they only care about numbers and they don't care who it yeah. is. Say they would kill for them. I don't like maybe be slightly cynical there. Well I, I I think that is fair, but I think if you are if you are like a if you look at the statistics of trade unions within the UK, I don't know what it's like in Germany, the average member of a trade union is ten years away from retirement. So, so it's been the rest away from what? Ten years away from retirement. So they're in their like late fifties. Mid to late fifties. So obviously that if you are a trade union organizer or an officer looking at that, you would prefer membership in the in the twenties and thirties, right? So I think that is a fair point. Yeah? A question because you said like um, your dramatic thing more diverse, um, does it also include people like with um, migrating people, migrants, and also like POC people or anything? Or? Yeah, so that's that's largely in London is where like our highest number of like migrant workers and members are. And that's also just because there's a lot more people in London and like as a migrant to the country you go there first and then you realise it's horrible and you go somewhere else. But, uh, I'm not giving you a very good impression of London, but I, I refuse to. I'm from Manchester. Right. Yeah. So I think that like, and that, like, so in the casework I've done for migrant workers, a lot of them have said to me, I didn't know there were unions in this country. This is amazing. So like that does kind of tell you something about how the UK is viewed by like a lot of apoliticised, like apolitical migrants, like people who have just come here for jobs rather than to come to study or come to Thank you for listening to Talking Shop, a podcast by new syndicalists for trade union activists and organisers. If you'd like to listen to previous episodes or review our other content, please check out our website, newsyndicalist.org. You can also keep updated on future episodes through subscribing to our podcast via Acast, iTunes or Stitcher. While you're there, why not leave us a review to help us find more people like yourself? If you have a suggestion for future content, if you'd like to submit your own ideas and would like to discuss any of the ideas raised in this or previous episodes, please contact us at newsyndicalist at gmail.com. Thanks again. Bye.